Well, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi. Today we're going to discuss cervical cancer. I have the pleasure of being with Dr. Lorraine Portalance, Associate Professor of Radiation Oncology at the University of Miami. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Dr. Portalance, would you please explain what the cervix is and what is cervical cancer? Yes, absolutely. So the cervix is the most inferior part of the uterus. It is this part of the uterus that the gynecologist could see when performing a physical examination. A cervical cancer is a cancer which is going to take its root in that very inferior part of the uterus called the cervix. I see. Well, what are some risk factors for developing cervical cancer? There are many risk factors for developing cervical cancer and we could group them in fact in two families. One is related uh, to the sexual activity of a young woman. So if a woman starts to have sexual activity at a younger age, has multiple sexual partners, multiple pregnancies, this will constitute one family of risk factors. And the other family is more related to other medical conditions that a young woman could have, which would decrease her immune system like, for example, HIV or patients who are taking medication for any medical condition which will decrease their defense, their immune system. Mm -hmm. What about the HPV virus? Would you please explain what that is? Absolutely. So, the HPV virus, HPV stands for Human Papilloma Virus. So, you've noticed when I described the risk factor that it had to do with the immunity or to a risk of exposure to something, number of partners, age at which we start to have a sexual activity. And all this is because if we have more partners, we're at higher risk to have exposure to HPV. The HPV virus is, in fact, worldwide the most frequent virus that human could uh, get in, in contact with. And what's happening is when this human papilloma virus is in contact with the body mucosa, it could induce some changes into the cells, which could eventually lead to cancer. Does every woman that contract HPV develop cervical cancer, or do most women clear that? We believe that up to 80% of women of 50 years old were at any point in their life in contact with the HPV virus but a very small fraction of those women are going to really develop the cervical invasive cervical cancer. So most of the women who are in contact with it are going to clear it out of their system, providing that they have an adequate immune system. I see. Is there anything that can be done to prevent the HPV? That's a very good question. So um, one of the things that could be done, among other things, is uh, to use the vaccine. So there is now a vaccine which is available. The recommendation is to give the HPV vaccine to women between 8 and 25 years old. Ideally, we like to give the vaccine prior to any exposure to the HPV virus. And therefore, we start at a young age, at an age where the women are not yet sexually active. Um, other ways that could be used, of course, are all those, you know, methods that we could have to improve the, you know, safe sex with using condom, other kind of protection, and going for, for good life habit, also with more stable sexual life, less partners. Women always ask us, is it still helpful to receive the HPV vaccine after you've been diagnosed with a cervical cancer? Really, the role of HPV vaccine is at the level of the primary prevention, its main role, and its efficacy once you've developed the cervical cancer is not any proven. I see. Now, the, the cervical cancer is usually a squamous cell cancer. Would you please explain what that is and how is that different from small cell squamous? Absolutely. So, if we look at the cervix, the type of cells that are lining the cervix are squamous cell. And these are the ones which in contact with the HPV virus are going to start to have changes into the cell and develop a cancer at the level of the cervix. So I think that about 85% of the patients who are found to have a cervical cancer have a cancer of this type called the squamous cell carcinoma. Less frequently, we could also find a cancer into the gland, which are embedded into that mucosa, which will then be called an adenocarcinoma. 
And then the small cell cancer is a type of cancer which is much less frequent at the level of the cervix, but it could happen just as it, it could happen in the lungs and other places into the body. And what is different with that small cell cancer is that it has the tendency to spread uh, earlier to other organs into the body. I see. Why is advanced cervical cancer more prevalent in the developing world than in the United States? Well, that's a very good question. Um, in the United States, there, there are, in fact, I would say two main factors, but one is uh, it, it, it indicates the importance of a good screening program, mm -hmm. that's what I would say. So women who, from the moment they are sexually active, go for pap tests and, and gynecological examination, are, have a higher chance to be found to have changes into the cells of the cervix that could lead to you know, closer follow-up and prevention of the development of invasive cancer, whereas we think that this type of care is not available in underdeveloped countries and therefore women will seek medical help once they have you know, major symptoms from their cervical cancer. Um, there is probably also another factor if we look at the prevalence of uh, cervical cancer in those underdeveloped countries. Um, I mean, this is an area where we look when we look at the risk factors, uh, the, the, the social habits in those populations are probably making them more prone to develop cervical right. cancer. Well, let's say back here in the United States, a woman has a pap smear and the results come back as CIN, cervical intraepithelial intra neoplasia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for that patient? That's a very good question. It means, first of all, that she'll have to stick to a very close follow-up, mm -hmm. basically. Um, some patients who do have CIN, the lesion will simply be found to regress by itself, and they don't even need treatment. So there's different grade, but if it's CIN, which is associated with you know high risk features, when you look at those cells, then that lesion should be cleared out. Those patients who are found to have CIN, they're going to be brought to a gynecologist, and they will undergo you know a, a test which is you know more detailed than the standard Pap test and gynecological exam that we usually do in our primary care office, a physician office. And that test is called a colposcopy, where they're going to look with the magnifier at the cervix and seek for any changes that should trigger further treatment. I see. So, I mean, what are the symptoms of advanced cervical cancer to begin with? Generally, most of the women who have advanced cervical cancer will come with a history of uh, uh, vaginal bleeding after a sexual intercourse. That is you know, largely the most frequent symptoms. Um, in addition to this, the patient could have some symptoms which are due to local extension of that tumor. The tumor starts in the cervix, but then it could extend to other organs in the pelvis and lead, for example, to uh, difficulty urinating, or if it's even more advanced, blood in the urine, uh, difficulty having uh, bowel movements, passing stools, or pelvic pain, or then if it leads to any obstruction of the ureter, they could even have lower back pain associated with their cervical cancer. These are the symptoms you know, associated with the, 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 locally, the local symptoms from the disease. And then, as with any other cancer, the patients could have some more general symptoms, sensation of fatigue, decreased appetite. Is there any evidence that taking herbs or vitamins might decrease the risk of developing cervical cancer? You know, we've discussed earlier what is the risk factor for cervical cancer is exposure to HPV. So any life habit which is going to decrease exposure to HPV is going to be key in preventing cervical cancer, but there is no study to support that any other changes in your life habit, like eating certain mm -hmm. vitamins or herbs, are going to help you to prevent uh, developing a cervical cancer. What about genetic counseling? Patients and even their family members always ask us, does a patient need genetic counseling if they've been diagnosed with cervical cancer? So, for now, there is no genetic signature. There is no uh, hereditary, hereditary screening that one could do to see if someone is you know, more at risk of developing cervical cancer than, than another one. 
uh, the story would be very different for a patient diagnosed with ovarian cancer or colon cancer for which we know that we clearly have familial history and a signature that we could look for in the gene of the patient. With cervical cancer, there is no such a thing. I see. Okay, now let's assume, we'll discuss the, the, the specifics of the treatment later, but assuming a patient's had a pap smear, which is abnormal, leads to a colposcopy, which shows a large cervical lesion, Generally speaking, what happens next for that woman? Then this woman, if, for example, this was first found in the office of a primary care physician, certainly for the colposcopy, she was referred to a gynecologist who has an expertise in, in the treatment or, of cervical cancer. And this is key. When a patient is found to have a cervical cancer, she should then be taken in charge by a team who is specialized in the care of this kind of cancer. Some gynecologists will specialize in the management of early cervical cancer, but from the moment where we have the feeling that it is a more advanced disease, I would strongly favor that patients should be seen by a gynecologist who is a specialist in gynecology treating women with cancer, and from there be taken in charge by a team of, you know, a strong multidisciplinary oncology team. I see. And what are your recommendations to family members of patients who have been diagnosed with cervical cancer? In fact, I always tell my patients and their family that family members and friends are key in the management of cancer. They are very important team members and their presence is going to make the whole difference in how a patient is going to tolerate treatment and win the battle. Support from positive family members is extremely important. That's very true. Are there any support groups that you recommend your patients join? Well, there is uh, support groups that are um, sponsored by the American Cancer Society, so I think that this is a very good reference for our patients. They could go on the website of the American Cancer Society and indicate uh, where the area where they live, and from there they will have access to many resources which could be you know, either for education of the patient, of the family, education of the treatment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational.